Hello, everyone. We are streaming live. Attendees in the queue are now being led in across Canada and worldwide. Welcome to What's Up Wednesday, December 8th, 2021. My name is Craig Mackay, your host. We have a wild and wonderful show lined up today. It's great to see everyone. Thanks for joining us. Turn on your videos. Let's see your happy faces. We've got people joining us uh, still entering the queue. Welcome to our What's Up Wednesday digital lunch. Wherever you are, whether it's lunchtime, tea time, sub supper time, or even later, we are glad to have you here. What's Up Wednesday, the digital lunch series is brought to you by the Institute of Certified Management Consultants of Ontario in cooperation with the Canadian Association of Management Consultants. FYI, we have some really interesting guests lined up for the new year. On January 12th, we will focus in depth on LinkedIn, how to use LinkedIn for your personal branding and prospecting new clients. Our main guest, Jeff Nelson, CEO of Anduro Marketing, will walk us through the necessary steps, best practices, key tips, tricks to rock your profile. In addition, we plan to have a few special guests to give us some specific examples of using some of the newest features and capabilities within LinkedIn. Then on February 9th, the topic will be the power of meeting in circles. Wes Patterson, CMC from Medicine Hat, Alberta, Corporate Learning and Development President at Patterson Consulting, author, speaker, and optimist, will be joining David Rastoul from Medicine Hat College. He's also known as Mijizi Wasa Iwabit, Eagle Who Sees Far. They will be discussing the power of meeting in circles. We will gain insight and wisdom on how to learn from Indigenous culture and apply the values of that learning experience into lessons that can be shared, taught, and readapted for management consulting approaches to finding business solutions. The power of meeting in circles. And then on March 8th, women in consulting will be the topic. Backed by popular demand, our annual panel of female CMC leaders with a few new additions will discuss trending topics on women in consulting. So it's going to be a great new year. If you are a guest today, consider a full-time membership. There are many benefits. To learn more, visit our website at cmcontario.ca and cmccanada.ca to find out how to join and earn your CMC designation. Before we introduce our guest, a few housekeeping rules. Please note that today's entire session will be recorded. The PowerPoint deck will be made available to those registered for today's event. All recordings, by the way, are available on the CMC Canada YouTube channel. As usual, we will take questions via the chat method during the presentation. Type your questions into the chat. I'll sort through them and present questions during the Q&A portion at the end of the presentation, around 1.20 Eastern Standard Time. Our guest speaker today is Carrie Lysenko. She is the Chief Operating Officer at Zucasa a Canadian firm that specializes in merging digital technology, online marketing with offline activities to connect people. Carrie Lysenko is a professor at York University and was recently named one of Canada's top 50 executives by the Globe and Mail. Carrie has been the lead on major digital campaigns for clients such as the Toronto Blue Jays, the Weather Network, Motorcycle.com, Molson's, the Vancouver Canucks, Auto Guide, and a very small startup firm known as Coca-Cola. Remember that song, I'd Like to Buy the World a Coke? Kind of brings back memories of people standing around a Christmas tree. Now that's what I call marketing and communications. My favorite guru of mass communications was Marshall McLuhan. He wrote that when the electronic media replaces visual culture with oral culture, we will have entered a new age. Humankind will move from individualism 
and fragmentation to a collective identity with a tribal base. Well, the internet has taken us to the next level of that new age. McLuhan's coinage to describe his social organization was the global village. With the World Wide Web, the global village is now a full-fledged jungle. Here to help us make sense of it is our guest of the day. Please welcome Carrie Lysenko. Hello, everybody. It's so nice to spend this time with you. Um, thank you for sharing your lunch or break with me today. Um, you know, I think uh, for many of us, uh, as we've grown up and seen the expansion of uh, the internet and the introduction of social media and networking, um, not only have we realized, um, you know, what benefits it can have, but its complexity. And so today I'm hoping um, to talk really about some more practical tips um, and to increase your own effectiveness out, um, online, as well as uh, introducing some of these things to any, some potential or current clients. Um, but I want to get a sense of how important you think a digital presence is to your business um, or to a business. So there's a poll right at the bottom there if you want to jump in. Um, we'd love to get a sense of where you're starting from. Poll's not coming up for some reason. Um, I will ask work for me. It's coming up for a lot of people, so I'm not sure why it's not coming Work for me. I just voted. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Raj. <laughs> So, I mean, for most of you, um, very important or important, um, you know, I guess, you know, good thing to know is that um, there's not a lot of you saying it's not important at all. Um, you know, we, the reason we call it a digital jungle or, you know, sometimes I refer to it as an ocean uh, is because if we think about, you know, just the amount of activity that happens even within 60 seconds every day um, on the internet, uh, if you wanna go to the next slide, Um, you know, there are over 200,000 people tweeting. Uh, there are um, 695,000 Instagram stories shared, over 500 hours of content uploaded to YouTube every 60 seconds, and over 1.4 million users are scrolling on Facebook. It is a tremendous amount of activity. Um, it is a tremendous amount of time that's actually spent online. <laughs> um, and some of the things we're going to start out to talking about today are just about, you know, how do Canadians use um, digital media. Where are they spending their time? And I know many of you are either working currently with international clients or you're pitching towards international clients. Um, so how do we compare um, in Canada versus globally? Um, and so if we want to start to look through some of the um, data, um, we will talk about top trends, like I said, emerging digital platforms. Um, we're going to talk about social media presence in particular. Um, for many of us, I think social media um, is an exciting world. We participate in it ourselves, uh, but sometimes it can be overwhelming to figure out, okay, where do I spend my time? Where do I get the most value? So we're, we're going to talk specifically about how to do an audit based on your own social profiles, as well as, again, you could leverage this for either a current or future client. Um, and then we're going to do a little takeaway um, around how to improve your own profile on LinkedIn, a bit of a precursor to kind of that broader, more in-depth um, segment that uh, is coming up on January 12th with Jeff Nelson. So that'll be a great opportunity to kind of get a head start. So how do Canadians spend their time online? Let's take a look. So if we take a look, um, you know, we are actually spend less time per day um, in terms of the total amount of minutes um, than the worldwide average. That might be surprising to us some. Um, this is January 2021 data. Um, great resource um, and a free resource that people can use. Uh, it's a company called We Are Social. Um, and they measure not only Canadian stats, but they also measure and compare across global internet usage. So this is a really good opportunity to get some of that information um, that sometimes is harder to find from a reputable source. Again, that's We Are Social. Um, so you'll see, you know, and again, depending on um, where you might be operating or where you might be thinking about expanding, um, you can see uh, how Canada, again, compares to some of the other countries around the world. 
when we're spending time online, one of the things I think that's important for people to remember, because we as, as kind of knowledge workers and individuals and consultants spending so much time on a laptop uh, or a desktop within our home offices or in our brick and mortar offices is um, how much time people actually spend on mobile. Um, mobile only users is um, the most growing segment uh, within the Canadian market. It's the fastest growing. So those are people who connect to the internet online every day, but only via a mobile device. So their experience is really limited to this screen. Um, it is definitely a growing percentage. And if we see in terms of the total internet time spent online, you can see that ticking up every single year. Interestingly, you know, the consumption on mobile, and if, even if you think about your own behavior, how much time you might be spending either in an elevator or on transit or in the evenings, um, just maybe scrolling on your smartphone, um, mobile users consume actually two times more minutes versus desktop users in times of overall time spent. And you can see where Canada fits again in terms of mobile usage versus um, some of the other countries featured here. Um, one of the things to, to talk about as well, though, is that um, you know, we have, we have a really interesting and unique um, issue here in Canada, whereas we have some of the most expensive mobile plans in Canada <laughs> um, and across the globe. And so at a lot of times we buy our mobile service from uh, a provider, right? And we buy our phones from our provider. Most of us are stuck to a two to three year contract. It just helps to influence the way we spend time online. Um, and so when we think about, you know, some of the initiatives around, um, you know, the, the space exploration and bringing internet to the globe, um, bringing, um, you know, internet to more remote communities, um, all of this is just going to amplify the importance of digital, um, not only across Canada, um, but across the globe, and more people will come online. Um, we've got about, you know, kind of 87% of Canadians are online right now. Um, but this will just continue to grow as access becomes uh, more favorable. And again, you know, if some of you are spending time or if you're calling from a remote community and you've been, you know, trying to, to move online primarily throughout this pandemic, you will know how important um, internet and reliable internet access is. So again, this is a, these are numbers to watch as we move forward. Interestingly too, um, where are people spending time? So we know they're on mobile devices more often than not. Um, are they looking onto a website? More often they aren't. They're actually via their favorite apps. And so um, even if you take a look at your own usage again, where are you spending the most of the time when you open up your smartphone? Um, it's more likely in an app environment than it is um, on a mobile browser. So you may be, um, you might search for something, but then you'll maybe download an app that kind of suits your needs, and especially in the social network environment, um, it's definitely in an app. Um, and interestingly, there are more connected mobile devices now in the world than there are people. So think about and look at your own phone and talk about, um, you know, what are, what are the, the, the apps on your home screen that are most important to you? Um, and, you know, we're going to talk a little bit about the breakdown um, in age in terms of the most popular apps. If we go forward another couple mm -hmm. screens, um, we will see. So right now, if we think about the top mobile app, apps ranked mm -hmm. by unique visitors. So this is the volume of visitors that visit each month. And you can see where that is in terms of um, this is the top eight. So um, by category, by age group, um, you mm -hmm. can there's something really interesting, actually, when you start to look at all the individuals. Um, has anybody noticed some similarities here? The big piece is that a lot of the top eight are owned by two companies, Facebook and Google. So Facebook has Facebook, obviously, Facebook Messenger. Um, they also have, own Instagram. Um, they also own WhatsApp. And then you've got Google, which is Google Maps, Google Search, YouTube, Gmail, Google Play. Um, so there's, you know, when we talk about big tech and you hear about big tech, you know, kind of listening into the news, um, you realize how pervasive those two, two companies are and the volume of time we spend online. What's also really interesting is if you, um, if you uh, go forward one more slide, this number has changed dramatically. So in 2018, you look at that top eight, it's actually quite different. You'll see, for example, Snapchat 
um, you know, really didn't enter into kind of that older group, but now it is. Um, and you'll see that, you know, some of those, uh, some of those, the, certainly the top three, you know, you can look at the number one was Facebook. Um, now that's being replaced by YouTube. Um, and soon it's actually re being replaced again. We've got some new stats for you as well um, in terms of where are younger millennials um, spending their time online. So where are your customers or importantly, where are your clients customers? So social media and why we're talking about a social media audit today is that so much of your audience is actually spending time in social. So we've got about 55% of Gen Z about 40% of millennials and 25% of Gen X. Um, that's a tremendous amount of minutes and hours per day um, spent both on Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn, Pinterest, TikTok, um, you know, all of the, those that get kind of lumped into that networking um, arena. Um, new sites, you can see that, you know, there's been obviously a lot um, in, over the past few years about, you know, repu the importance of reputable news and information, um, you know, how people are getting their facts online. Um, within that younger group, um, less and less are relying on news sites. Now, we did see a spike during the pandemic as people were really seeking out important and critical information. Um, but more often, you've got your older generation, Gen X, 45% um, using and leveraging those um, reputable news sites. Um, millennials at 35% and Gen X even less. So they're relying much more on what they're seeing through social media. And portal sites. So portal sites, um, you know, used to be quite popular a number of years ago. Um, for many people, it was that default homepage where they opened up their browser. Um, but that the usage has really started to decline. And people are really finding that in many cases, their news is being fed to them much more easily through a feed, um, or through notifications and alerts on some of the apps they have on their phones. So TikTok, um, you know, many folks think TikTok is only for tweens and teenagers, <laughs> um, but it's actually the most downloaded app in July this summer and continues to, to be the number one downloaded app across both app stores um, in 2021, beating out giants like Facebook, beating out giants like YouTube, um, Instagram, you know, this has come on as a force. Um, for uh, those of you who aren't aware, TikTok is actually owned um, by a Chinese company called Doyen, um, and they, uh, they bought a app that existed a couple of years ago called Musical.ly. They rebranded it TikTok, um, and now it's, uh, it's becoming really a, a great way to get video messaging out there um, and coming across multiple demographics. So again, really extending beyond the 18 plus age and moving more into the millennial and Gen X segment. Um, so, you know, many people think, oh my goodness, like TikTok is just for, again, younger kids, or it's just, um, you know, lip syncing or dancing videos. What we're really seeing is a surge in educational type of information. Um, I can show you some examples, or you can go on to, Zucasa has a TikTok channel. You'll see how we're sharing out market insights and real estate metrics. Um, and there's a lot of brands that you'll see are coming online because the audience is there. And so, um, that's one of the interesting pieces is that when you continue to look at this data over time, you see how behaviors start, start to shift um, and your audience that you're looking for is starting to appear in some of these networks that originally we thought were really geared towards much younger users. So, like I said, pandemic has certainly changed some of our behaviors. And so um, interestingly, how has it changed yours? You know, most of us were online a lot of times during the day anyway, um, but have we seen a significant increase, slight increase, or really your usage has stayed the same when you think about how much time you're spending online? significant increase for many of you. I will echo that. <laughs> I've spent way more time online um, than I used to. And, uh, and, and really, I think for some of us, our, that behavior, even as things in our communities have opened up, um, we're kind of easing back into it, right? So I'm still heavily reliant on the internet in terms of our connections. 
uh, in terms of networking. Look at us all here in this virtual conference, how convenient is, this is um, when we're able to knowledge share and network um, in this larger community versus in person, although I miss people in person so much, um, but it is it does provide some wonderful opportunity. Um, so we're not alone. Um, digital media consumption definitely has increased. We saw a spike really just the week of <laughs> um, when things really began to lock down last year in March of 2020. Um, and really that trend has continued. And uh, um, while it has fluctuated slightly over the summertime as we were feeling more open to go outside, um, it's definitely stayed a steady state. Um, what's really interesting too is how people's consumption um, in e-commerce uh, has changed. And I think even when we think about our own behaviors, um, if you go to the next slide, you can see um, just how some of the, um, you know, how do we spend our time online and how do we spend our money online has changed dramatically. So um, overall retail, like some, some crazy increases in terms of furniture and home sales, general sales online. A lot more of us too have been participating in online subscriptions, um, you know, and things like online fitness classes, which you know, really weren't really a, a huge element of our lifestyle before, which has now just become, um, you know, part of how we're spending our time online and leveraging online resources. Furniture and home. Oh my goodness, I bought a couch online over the pandemic. <laughs> I never thought I'd buy a huge purchase like that. That's a couch I never sat on. Um, but more and more of us, obviously, and it's just fundamentally changed the way we behave. Um, it's our comfort level in terms of e-commerce has accelerated tremendously. Um, in some cases, they estimate we've advanced five to 10 years in terms of our comfort level for online spending. Um, you know, even uh, spending in mobile payments within stores when you are out and about, um, that has changed dramatically as well. Um, so if anything, this has been, um, been able to give us a huge boost in terms of our um, digital acceptance for some of these behaviors that, that really just felt um, uncomfortable or unlikely that we were going to participate in them previously. So social media for business. So we talked a little bit about how Canadians are spending online, a time online. Uh, obviously, it's significant. <laughs> you know, people are spending six, seven hours online every single day. Um, so for those of you who really felt that digital was important to your business, I would echo that. Um, and, you know, how do we navigate through, again, so some of that jungle, it feels some like, like a jungle or like an ocean, you know, how do I find my place? How do I find the community that I think of, of users? How do I, do I deliver my message, the right message to the right person at the right time? And that's what's so wonderful about digital is that you can find these groups. Um, so how do we leverage social media? Well, let's first get a sense of, you know, do you think social media presence is beneficial for a business? Just give everyone a few minutes to answer. So, I mean, excellent answer. Some some aren't sure, right? And that's okay. Um, you know, absolutely. And sometimes I think you know what where this uh, comes into play is in the network in particular. So what we're going to talk about during our social media um, audit is um, okay where are we spending, where, where is, what social networks are important to me? And so here's just some stats of what, of, that will hopefully make you realize that social media can be important and really critically impactful for your business. And so 55% of consumers learn about brands on social. Um, you know, think of, again, about your own behavior and where you're scrolling online and, and maybe where you're clicking or seeing images of something that you wanna buy. 68% of consumers agree that social media enables them to interact with brands. And so that's a really important aspect too, is, is, are you, is, uh, is there someone from a brand that you represent or your own brand interacting with people on social? 43% of consumers increased their social media use to discover new products in the last year. Um, you know, again, spending so much more time online throughout the pandemic, you know, our opportunity to hear about and learn about new products 
Um, and we're also buying new things, right? You know, masks obviously wasn't that important, hand sanitizer, um, some of these other elements that we're discovering new products that we never needed before. Um, you know, we're hearing about a lot of these on social media. You know, also, you know, there's a great opportunity to control the narrative on social media. So 78% of consumers are willing to buy for a from a company after having a positive experience. Um, it, you know, there's an opportunity as well, not only, um, you know, there's a question from Christopher about B2B versus B2C. Um, you know, again, a lot of you are, um, you know, your business owners, your entrepreneurs, um, you know, you're working with other businesses. You know, there's an opportunity, especially on LinkedIn, um, which is a professional network environment um, to deliver a more B2B focused um, messaging. Um, the other piece too is that sometimes people think social media is only about you know what we do in our personal lives um, but the reality is we we are who we are and we take us wherever we go and so you know is there an opportunity to reach somebody on facebook who is also an entrepreneur or a business owner absolutely and so um you know and there's data available within um you know facebook targeting that will help you it is important when you think about how do you deliver and and present your profile within a, a social environment um you know things around facebook business pages you know how does that present itself so that you can capture some of that interest whether it's a consumer or um you know another a, a b2b client so um 80 of business executives thinks it's important or essential to invest in um, in social media uh, and marketing. So, you know, how do you, um, you know, when you're, when you're working with a client or pitching a client, um, you know, how do you, again, you know, kind of propose some improvements um, that right, might really be able to have a positive impact and outcome on their business results? Um, you know, a lot of business owners um, increasing their social media marketing budgets um, and using 72% um, of companies using social media data to inform business decisions. So a great opportunity, um, you know, to kind of get consumer awareness or uh, consumer sentiment around your business. Um, I worked very closely with a data scientist who we had an opportunity to work with. He had done a previous um, kind of project uh, and initiative with Canadian Tire during the early stages of the pandemic. And one of the things that they were looking to do was how did they comb, they combed across Twitter and looked for keywords as specifically around their e-commerce. Um, and if any of you bought anything from Canadian Tire <laughs> during the early stages of the pandemic, um, their e-commerce solutions and curbside pickup was pretty bleak. And so a lot of brands actually use social media to understand the narrative about their company and how they were some you know, change, fundamentally changing some of their processes around curbside pickup, around home delivery, around free and, and, and contactless delivery. Um, so social media was is where the conversation is happening was really useful for some of these brands. It could be useful for your brand as well. So why do an audit of social media? So, um, you know, a lot of times you'll, you'll see, again, for both your business or maybe a business that you're working with, is that you know which posts are working and why so you get some of that analytical data and understand okay what is resonating what is the messaging that's resonating with audiences out there um it gives you a great opportunity to understand and appreciate what competitors are doing in your space um again i talked a little bit about which social media networks are working for you right this is a really key component especially when you're maybe a solopreneur or you have a smaller team and you're trying to determine where do you spend your investment Again, what is the community saying? What is the narrative or the sentiment out there? Um, social network auditing is a really great way to figure that out and manage it over time. Um, are your social profiles aligning with your business? So are you setting um, goals and targets around that? And are you understanding where your social media efforts are going and how they're driving business value? All of this can kind of come between a social media audit. You're, today, you're also gonna receive a template that'll allow you to get started. Um, as soon as this is done. And so that will be in your inbox, um, but it'll go through these steps. So I appreciate you may be taking notes, but you'll also get a handout at the end of the session. So I've really broken down the audit into five steps. Um, so first of all, we're gonna look at the bio. And so the profile, uh, followers and following, um, your posts, competitors, and overall performance. So if we start at the bio, and I picked uh, one of the fun examples. 
uh, KFC. <laughs> Many of us have heard about KFC, I'm sure. Um, so when you read each bio, um, making sure that it actually talks about what you do and who you are. And so many times people, you know, they might uh, not put anything very robust, uh, but this is a great opportunity, again, to talk about your brand, um, to talk about what you offer, um, and also including things like relevant hashtags, um, which, you know, kind of trending topics that'll help you um, turn up in search results. Um, they talk about, you can link to a customer, customer support or contact information. You can also link to other properties that might be relevant. So, um, you know, KFC, they could also link potentially to the website. Um, they can also follow and have following the company CEO. Um, but making sure that, you know, your profile and your bio really represent who you are and are aligned with your business. Um, you'll also notice there's an opportunity not only to put in a, you know, a, a profile photo, um, but an opportunity to um, actually put a, a background image that again, you know, this has been updated in this case um, that really talks about quick pickup, order head, park, pick up and eat um, with a winter theme. So obviously they're, you know, kind of keeping their profile pages up to date. Um, and you'll notice they actually don't even have any pictures of chicken. <laughs> so, you know, really leveraging, you know, the brand identity around the kernel um, and, uh, you know, people having fun eating chicken, I guess, or after they eat chicken. <laughs> um, you'll notice they have uh, quite a large amount of followers, 1.5 million. They're not following um, very many people though. So uh, there's only 11. And we'll talk about that in the next slide when we talk about followers and following. So followers and following. Um, I've, I've put a little lesser known brand here um, called Canadian Woodworks. Um, and I wanted to show this because many of you think, okay, well, KFC, they've got tons of money. Um, they've got lots of employees that can help support them in terms of delivering, um, uh, you know, they can, in terms of, you know, constantly posting. Um, but, you know, Canadian Woodworks is a really, it's a much smaller organization. Obviously it's Canadian. Um, this is an Instagram, this is our Instagram handle. Um, but you can see that they have over 400,000 followers um, and they're, they're following some key accounts. And so one of the things you want to do is check your platform to see if there are restrictions, first of all, for who you can follow. So Twitter's limit is 5,000, while Instagram's is 7,500. Um, but there's an opportunity to connect with other like-minded businesses within your community um, and follow each other or follow them. Um, not only will you learn more about what's happening and keep um, within kind of the conversation, but again, it'll help you show up more in search results. Um, interestingly enough, the previous example, KFC, um, they only follow those 11 people because there are, there are five former Spice Girls and six guys named Herb because it's 11 herbs and spices. So um, kind of a more famous example of, um, you know, their Twitter account. Um, but what I wanted to showcase, especially in this one, because it is more of a niche, um, this is around woodworking and education. Um, they're also leveraging Instagram, which is a great visual platform um, to show their projects. Um, so they're using Instagram Reels. Um, they're showing big uh, pictures um, of their finished projects. Um, and they've also obviously linked to other relevant channels like YouTube. And so there's, a, again, a great opportunity. Interestingly, the same company um, only has about 400 followers on Facebook business. So for them, a huge amount of their effort and where they're seeing results is in Instagram. And so that's okay too. If, it, if you find that one or two or three social medias are really are really you know blossoming for you and growing um, that's a great place to spend your effort and that's one of the things that an audit will show you and and kind of bring to the surface so posts so i've added in uh, this is zucasas so this is our instagram um, account um, so one of the things that we do on a weekly basis is review our top performing posts and really understanding what is resonating with our audience for example, we've been exploring a lot more around Instagram Reels, um, finding that um, Rachel here, who is um, my manager of PR and content marketing, um, when we have a, a, a face or a, a human a spokesperson in the videos, they tend to do a lot better in terms of like 200% better in terms of the, the volume of impressions. Now, that may not be the same for you and your business, um, but it is working for us. And so we've trialed and maybe tested this against kind of the textual um, market updates that you see kind of in the headlines there. So right here. 
Um, also, this is a visual tour with one of our agents, also performed really, really well. Again, that human spokesperson in the videos really just seems to resonate with our audience. Um, we also have a number of links here. So whether it's market reports, whether it's different tools, learning about our company, um, some of the news were frequently put in the news. Um, so those are just really easy to find links um, that, that drive impressions and volume of traffic back to our, our main property, which is zucasa.com. Um, also, the other piece too is mixing up your content cocktail. Like I said, we did a, we've done a lot of A-B testing and continue to do so um, to say, okay, what was work, working well here? Is it images? Is it videos? Is it videos with a uh, human spokesperson? Is it just text and animations? Um, and what kind of hashtags are really resulting in a lot of sharing or a lot of um, engagement? Um, and thankfully, a lot of networks actually um, will provide you with basic analytics um, when you go into each of your accounts. Competitors. So, you know what, you can learn a lot from competitors. That's what's so great about social networks is that's all open. And so, you know, what, one of the opportunities to identify about three to five competitors to monitor social media um, that you think are either doing really well and you've noticed that from their following account or followers accounts, and they seem to post frequently. Um, so keep an eye up in terms of what is their content cocktail. How are they sharing? How frequently do they post content? How much engagement, engagement do they typically get? Um, I've posted um, a, uh, you know, this is a different real estate organization. I love what they're doing in some of the, um, you know, putting the hashtags right into uh, some of the images, um, calling out again, um, some of the, the clients and buyers and, the, and doing that human face interaction in terms of the, um, the properties. Um, and they have obviously gorgeous photos. So some of these, the staging and um, you know, some of the uh, properties that they're able to showcase are really driving a lot of shares and a lot of views. So that's great. Um, you know, something that we, we know is working well for others um, that we wanna continue to pursue. When you're doing an audit, one of the great things is it, it is just time for you to step back and take that overall view. And so when you're centralizing that competitive information, um, either you're creating content or you have somebody on your team that's creating content or you're fundamentally making recommendations to another business, um, you can consolidate all of that information and have it in one place. Um, and then it's not just one and done. So the opportunity to look at competitors over time is also really helpful. Um, just because they're competitors doesn't mean that everything they do is gonna be wonderful. So when you have an opportunity to monitor them over time, um, you can see the changes and see the effectiveness of some of their things that they're doing and, you know, kind of take influence um, and flattery from um, leveraging some of those insights. Um, you know, social networks are an amazing petri dish of experimentation. And so there's a great opportunity for you to continue to learn and improve as you go. So finally, you know, making sure you understand how it's performing. So not just putting out um, tons of content, saying it and spraying it, um, you know, want to making sure, want to make sure you understand more in terms of where, again, you're putting your investment of your time. So diving deeper into the analytics of each post, understanding, you know, what is my new, is there a new audience that I'm reaching? Is it just the same total audience? Um, what is my audience growth over time? How am I in increasingly exposed to new communities um, and new uh, potential customers? Um, what are the total engagements? What are the different posts that are really resonating again? Um, how are they getting impressions? Are they getting into people's feeds? Are people watching them? What about video view clicks, link clicks? Um, and what is the type of demographics I'm reaching? You could have a post that's doing extremely well and has gone viral, but maybe it's re reaching not your target audience. And so, you know, instead of reaching maybe a thousand customers who aren't your target, maybe you want to reach only a hundred, but they're all in your key demographics and your key segments um, that you know are going to res respond favorably to your message and to your brand. And so these are the types of things that, you know, some of the analytics within each of the networks will be able to provide you. And again, it's just carving out that time to do the audit. Um, and again, we shared out and will share out um, a kind of a simple template to allow you to do that. So moving into final LinkedIn for you. So these are some tips and tricks that I think will be really helpful um, as you kind of move into how do you how do you stand out on LinkedIn? Like I mentioned, 
Um, LinkedIn is really that professional network, great for networking. Um, so important, which is why there's a whole separate segment, segment of What's Up Wednesdays just on LinkedIn. Um, so if we go to the next slide, we can see some examples. I've picked Ryan Roslansky here. Ryan is the CEO at LinkedIn. So if anyone should know how to use LinkedIn, I would hope it would be Ryan. Um, and so again, it's a professional network. It offers you a business focused place to talk about your brand. Um, and if there's a really, you know, there's a constant feed, depending on how much time you're spending on LinkedIn, you will have seen lots of examples of both images and videos, links to, um, you know, industry white papers, articles that people have written. Um, it's a tremendous place to kind of deliver content um, and specifically talk about your brand and what you do. And so, again, using it to spread the world, the word about your authority in your industry, and you can even use it for recruiting top talent. Um, I was just talking before the session started about, um, you know, a free option that people have on LinkedIn, which is to post uh, jobs within your network um, for free. And so you get a little hiring um, kind of badge within your profile photo um, that links directly to some of the posts that you might have up and jobs that you might be hiring for. Um, I've just done that recently. And, and honestly, within 20 minutes, I think I had 35 um, uh, uh, people apply directly from LinkedIn, um, which obviously people's LinkedIn profile provides a ton of information. Um, so yeah, just another way that you can kind of share out the word um, and grow your, uh, grow your network and grow your company. So um, some of these are, you know, these are kind of the, some of the featured posts um, that Ryan has put on. So they are like articles in the sense that, you know, there's an opportunity to write a lot of content. You can include imagery. Um, you know, and, and write about something that, you know, you're an authority on. Um, also something that might really be attractive to some of the clients you're trying to pitch towards um, or, you know, some of the, the customers you're trying to reach out to. So there's a great opportunity there to reach them um, within this platform. You can also leverage and reuse some of this content. So one of the things we think about on social is oh my goodness, I have to create, you know, five different articles. I've got to create one for Facebook. I've got to create one for um, maybe it's Medium. I've got to create another one for, um, you know, our video for Instagram. I got another one for YouTube. You know, we can leverage and reuse a lot of our content. One of the things that's really great about TikTok is that you can take a TikTok video and repost it to, um, uh, to YouTube, or you can repost it to Pinterest, or you can repost it, um, you know, so it doesn't necessarily have to be net new content every single time. Um, you can also see how that performs uh, across different platforms. Um, and again, when you do your social media audit and you measure the engagement in each of those posts, it'll really help you to do that. Um, we're going to go to the checklist. And I do, did notice in the, in the chat that one question was on the premium LinkedIn membership, so we will get to that. Um, but this is just kind of a short checklist that I'm hoping these are some of the things that you could do right when you, when you get off this call, right? If you carve out, you know, kind of an hour of your time, um, you can uh, maybe improve some of these profile pieces that you hadn't already included. Um, so personalized URL. So uh, one of the things that people don't realize is that when you sign up for LinkedIn, um, LinkedIn gives you a, a URL and that URL is distinctive to your profile. What you can do is you can go in and actually edit that URL. So it tells, it, it actually is your exact name. So mine, for example, is linkedin.com forward slash Carrie Lysenko, all one word. Um, it doesn't have some weird squiggly numbers or, or, or ampersands after it. Um, it's just Carrie Lysenko. And one of the things that helps to do is it helps for me to show up really high when anybody searches my name. And so one of the things you can do again right away is personalize your URL. Some of you might have a really common name like John Smith, um, so you might have to put uh, something else after it, um, but it is uh, but it, it is an opportunity for sure um, to highlight, uh, you know, again, showing up higher in search. Um, one question was talking about whether it's important to put your um, company name um, in your URL. I would suggest you have a separate page in LinkedIn that's actually your company page. Um, so don't change your own personal um, page to have your company name, have your company have a page in LinkedIn, uh, which is also free to start. And I'm sure actually Jeff is probably going to go into that more detail, but hopefully that is helpful. Um, making sure you have your degrees or accreditation besides your name. Um, that's one of the great things about um, probably a lot of people on here is that they've gone through a lot of effort to kind of upskill and train in certain areas and your subject matter expertise, which is why you're such great consultants. 
And so include those accreditations beside your name, making sure there's paramount that people understand, um, you know, uh, what you can bring to the table. Um, professional headshots. Um, so they are an investment for sure, but they are worthwhile. So not only can you use your professional headshot across multiple social networks, um, but making sure you know it's not a selfie or um, it's maybe not that picture from a, a friend's wedding. Um, it just shows that um, not only have you put in the effort, but it will have your whole um, profile look more polished. Um, a background image. Many people don't realize that this background image can be customized to whatever you want. So, um, you know, here we've got some photos. These are likely employees or maybe they're stock photos of employees, but, um, you know, and a hashtag in it together. Um, so one of the opportunities you have, um, so, you know, even connecting your corporate brand and your company LinkedIn with your personal profile um, is, you know, for instance, in my profile, if you look me up on LinkedIn, you'll see my background actually says Zucasa. So it has a nice branded image. It's done by a graphic designer and it says, find your home with us, uh, which is our tagline. Um, so it's an opportunity for me to, to emphasize our brand offering and emphasize our brand, even within my own personal LinkedIn profile. Um, you can, if you're you know, searching for new clients, you could have a nice graphic here that talks maybe about some things that you're really great at. Um, you know, again, putting your own company tagline or putting your own um, kind of subject matter expertise or offering right in that image is just another way that at the top of the page is going to reinforce who you are and what you're all about. Um, contact info. So making sure your contact info is up to date and it's right here so people can link on right away and get in contact you. Um, you know, again, this is all about networking. This is all about um, finding folks within your community that will help grow your business. And so having your contact info right there is critical. Um, auto name recognition. So, you know, I don't use auto name recognition. My, my name doesn't get um, confused very often, um, but Ryan Roslansky here does. <laughs> and so he's got a little audio recognition here. Um, it's really uh, highly accessible, especially to um, hearing impaired communities. Um, also though, if you have a, quite a difficult name to pronounce. So if you click on that um, auto name recognition, you'll hear Ryan's voice saying his own name. So there's an excellent opportunity as well for um, you to, you know, again, just build out your profile. Um, connections. So, um, you know, Ryan here is a verified account. He's obviously got a lot of followers as the CEO at LinkedIn, um, but many of us will have our connection count here. Um, and so one of the pieces uh, is, you know, go out and network. So you have an opportunity. There's 84 participants on this call alone, in which case you can um, maybe reach out. These are all, you know, members, active members in CMC. Uh, they're consultants too. They're probably working in different industries, but they're definitely interested and in, um, probably sharing their knowledge. And so there's always an opportunity to build out your connection network. And the reason that's important is that every time you post um, or every time you go into your feed, the more connections you have, the more you're exposed to, and the more people that will get exposed to whenever you post an article or a job um, or any type of update to your status. Um, so those things are a really great opportunity to continue to grow that connection. Um, update your employment, education, and clubs. Um, uh, this seems like an obvious one, but there's so many people who don't put descriptions of their employment, education, or clubs. And so there's a great opportunity so to not only put where you may be employed, um, but again, using that descriptive space um, with keywords that you think people might be searching for. So things like, you know, maybe you're in eco consulting, um, you know, you're environmental consulting, maybe you're in educational consulting. There's a great opportunity to use some of those keywords in your description that also help when you show up in search ranking. So when people are searching those keywords, um, so making sure each of your employment, your education, and maybe clubs or organizations that you belong to has a description. Recent posts. It's a great opportunity to post on LinkedIn. Not only, again, can you create really professional looking articles, but again, it will just get disseminated across your network. And then whenever anybody in your network likes it or reads it, um, it'll get shared with their network as, as well. So again, that kind of it is called a network, <laughs> so um, it'll it'll flow out into uh, into great opportunities to reach second and third party connections um, that maybe you're not uh, you haven't directly met yet. Um, following organizations of interest. 
this is another opportunity for you to just showcase who you are. Um, you know, and maybe if there's certain organizations that you're dying to work for or dying to work with, um, maybe start following them. And then you can also get a sense of how they're posting and some of the, in the interest that they might have. Finally, the premium LinkedIn membership. Um, so I have a premium LinkedIn membership. Um, I use it because I do a lot of recruiting online. Um, also, it gives me an opportunity, honestly, to kind of scope out some of my, um, you know, some people in a in an incognito way, um, which allows you, you're, you can do that as a premium member. Um, you get a little bit more information too about your own data. So not only, um, you know, how many likes or shares um, or comments I have on each of my posts, but who else is looking at my profile. Um, and I get a full list. Um, the other piece is um, they have a huge library of, um, of ma mastermind courses. Um, LinkedIn owns lynda.com. So they, there's a ton of online courses and those are all mostly free to take if you have a premium LinkedIn membership. So the premium membership is $65 a month. Um, obviously up to you whether or not you feel like it's worthwhile. Um, but those are just some of the things that, um, that you get with a LinkedIn membership. Um, and you get a little gold um, kind of LinkedIn um, insignia. And so there's, again, um, access to a lots of course data and um, industry and premium access to, uh, you know, kind of virtual seminars. Um, there's also an ability to see increased analytics about your own profile and others. Um, it helps also with recruiting if you have a premium membership and makes it easier to kind of, uh, to, um, to go out and find potential clients to work with. So it kind of helps your network. Um, so that's mm -hmm. it. I, hopefully I didn't go too fast. Oh my gosh, these lunches go so quick. Um, and mm -hmm. uh, I know that there's been lots of questions. And so I want to make sure we open up the last 10 minutes. So I'm going to mm -hmm. hand it over uh, to Craig, who I know has also been closely watching the chat. Well, thank you, Carrie. And right on time, we said we'd save 10 minutes for our Q&A. Um, a lot of good questions. One of the ones here that, that comes up a lot, and I just thought we could sort of go over this again quickly, is where should we put most of our effort? There's so many different social media outlets now. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, probably not the answer that you're going to want to hear, but it depends. <laughs> so um, I think for sure LinkedIn. I mean, we're, we're all professionals on this call. We're looking to network. Um, we're looking to either gain um, clients or referrals um, or to help out uh, our fellow um, you know, consultants. Um, there's great uh, organizations to connect with on LinkedIn. So absolutely, if you don't already have a presence, please get on LinkedIn. Um, you won't be sorry. Um, the next one is in terms of it depends. So it, it really does depend on, you know, what is, um, what is the type of businesses that you work with? Um, so many of you probably wouldn't have thought, you know, a woodworking, a small woodworking shop would have, you know, social media would have been important to them. But you know what, they're making um, projects, they're, they've launched into e-commerce, they're selling around the world. Um, Instagram, again, for example, proved to be really useful for them. Was Facebook pages really useful for them? No. Um, but did they try it? They tried it. And so, um, you know, you might find yourself, you have to do a little bit of experimentation to figure out what works for you. Um, I will say in my experience, Facebook generally has the best um, return in terms of driving traffic. So oftentimes when we post from our business pages, um, we get a lot of referral traffic. Um, also from, uh, from sharing. So if people pick up one of our articles or one of our listings and they actually share it within their own network, there are over 2 billion people online on Facebook. And so their network is just enormous, right? Whereas Twitter is about 300 million. So, um, you know, and Twitter, I find you, you, it's important if you want to get out a message and you want to have that communication on Twitter, but often they don't come back to a destination. They're going to stay within that environment. And so maybe if you have uh, an e-commerce business where it's um, really heavily customer support focused, um, a Twitter, um, you know, kind of uh, area that you can have conversation with clients might be really important for you. Um, so, you know, again, TikTok, it, do you have the type of business that um, works really well in a video context? Um, and again, maybe people wouldn't have thought, um, you know, talking about real estate stats. <laughs> I mean, for sure, maybe market like housing property tours work really well in video, but 
maybe people wouldn't have thought market stats really works well on video, but it does. Um, and we're getting thousands of, of video views every time we kind of publish one of these things where we just talk about the recent Treb data or we talk about the recent CREA data. And so you'll see lots of businesses as you start to explore under the lens of what are some of the other companies in my industry doing? And, what, and when you do that competitive audit, what are the things that are actually working really well? Um, so again, it kind of depends, um, but I would encourage you to experiment, um, but do the audit after the experimentation of like a month to see where you're at and then refocus and pivot your efforts into what's working for you. Or use some of the analytics from some of these sites to get a better handle on where you're getting most 100%. of your reaction. And obviously you're saying Facebook is still very well attended and a good stepping stone to bring people to the next level of your of your marketing effort. It is. And I think a lot of people think Facebook is just, again, that, that personal connection. Um, but you can't discount Facebook business pages um, and, and the ability for people to share interests across their own network. Um, I believe the average is every person has 198 connections. So, um, and that's over 2 billion people that are connected. So you got to think about how easily that message can kind of disseminate across that network. Um, again, though, it didn't work for Canadian woodworkers, <laughs> right, but it might right. work for you. <laughs> so question from Raj is, is it better to blog on the company website or LinkedIn? Um, so you can do both. So you can, um, you can blog on your company website and then post that link in LinkedIn. And again, that's a great opportunity in terms of leveraging content on multiple places, right? So um, you can still say post um, a great image, upload a great image um, from your blog, as well as, you know, kind of, you could do a teaser that said, like, check out what I said, um, my recent blog about blank, blank, blank topics, um, and then put the link there. Um, so there's an opportunity to do that. Um, you can also kind of cut and paste. You can also cut and paste directly. And so you're not rewriting it, um, but you're, there's an opportunity to either cut and paste or put a shortened version on LinkedIn. Um, I would say, generally speaking, people like to consume the content on the network versus going to another platform. And so, um, but again, if you've got some messaging in there that you want a broader audience to read and you're not getting the traffic to your own website, LinkedIn could be a great position for that. So you talked about repurposing content. Um, do you have some advice again that you can just uh, reiterate on some of the best tools for controlling your output? Um, yeah, I mean, I think there's, there's lots of, um, you know, kind of uh, software and tools that allow you to kind of schedule posts, um, uh, create it, uh, great graphics. Um, Canva is a great one. It's free. Um, I know that CMC Ontario has just posted that to everybody. Um, there's a content planner there. They have great social media templates. It's dead simple to use. Um, I am not a graphic designer and I've used it myself. <laughs> and so, um, you know, it's got got templates again for Instagram, Pinterest, everything is pre-formatted to the right size. Um, it just really helps to um, kind of streamline your workflow. And the, you know, you, you don't have to buy a, an enterprise version to get started. Again, you can do some experimentation with the free version, um, but also the enterprise version is only a couple hundred bucks a year. So, um, you know, and, and it just helps you can you know, if you, again, you want to build your content calendar and schedule postings, I think, I believe you have to have the enterprise version. Just want to find out from Chris Carter, if he has a follow-up question to, you answered the, you know, is the investment for premium license um, a good investment? And you answered some of that question, but maybe Chris could just uh, have a follow-up on that. Well, th thanks, Craig, for the opportunity to, to do that. Um, I mean, $65 you know, a, a month doesn't sound like a lot, but when you're already subscribing to Microsoft 365 and, and all these other things, you know, yeah. it, 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 it just, it, may, it makes me wonder. I mean, I use LinkedIn quite extensively, though I do find I, I try to moderate. I think people who post too often are, are kind of annoying. So you got to <laughs> find the right balance, right? So, so yeah. but the, I guess I'm trying to figure out, is it in a B2B context, especially where I'm just trying to establish a presence as a credible, hopefully, you know, useful and attractive management consultant to my clients. You know, th th that's that's the kind of that's where my other question is what came around presence. 
So I would also say, um, you know, go, maybe that's the last thing you do on the checklist. It's actually the reason that I put it last on the checklist, because I don't think it's the most important thing that you have to have a premium membership. Um, it, again, it's really useful if you want to, if you're doing a lot of recruiting or um, you, you're using the, the analytics heavily and or if you're leveraging some of their courses and mastermind sessions, like that, that there's a really great opportunity to get access to that. Um, having said that, if you, um, you know, a lot of library associations, like if you live in Toronto, for example, and you have a Toronto library card, you have access to lynda.com for free. So um, there's also a way that you can kind of navigate around some of that stuff. Um, without having the premium membership. Um, but I would say that um, there's a great opportunity for, for you to just go through that checklist and make some of those changes. If you've already done a lot of those things, you can just kind of give it a check mark, right? Um, but make some of those changes and see if that has an impact overall in terms of how many people are viewing your uh, profile um, and what kind of response are you getting from the network? Okay, thanks, Carrie. Thank We're going to wrap things up here. Uh, I put Chris on the spot for a second. So you never know, I might do that again in the future. And obviously, <laughs> the drill down that we're going to do next month on on LinkedIn is, is uh, very appropriate. Uh, a lot of great content there, Carrie. Uh, I also want to thank uh, Sandra Addison Brock for running this event. A couple of takeaways I have twice as many users on mobile devices than on desktop computers. 78% of consumers are willing to buy from a company after having a positive experience on social media. Follow the five audit steps. Focus on one or two primary social media or mediums. You've got some homework for next month. Complete your LinkedIn checklist. And on January 12th, we will drill down on how to use LinkedIn to rock your profile personal branding and marketing in LinkedIn with Jeff Nelson. And we've got a couple other special guests who will join us as well. And we'll, we will be drilling down on some of those employment uh, recruiting concepts as well. So until next time, Merry Christmas, Happy Hanukkah, Happy Holidays, have a Happy New Year. See you next year. Same time, same channel. Cheers, everyone.